Welcome to another episode of the Milwaukee Sports Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Falk, and I am joined today by Ben Shepard. Ben comes to us with a long background in soccer, from a playing perspective to coaching on the youth through collegiate level, and currently in his role as the co-director of coaching and wall coaching at FC Wisconsin. As you'll gather from his accent, not a native to the States, so Ben brings a worldly view of the game to the table. On top of that, this is actually our first ever transcontinental podcast as Ben is home with his family in England for the holidays. So I'm really excited to have Ben share his experiences and perspectives from his, you know, reflecting on his previous experiences, as well as his thoughts on youth soccer development and more. So we have been working with Ben and FC Wisconsin for more than four years now, and I've enjoyed getting to know the coaches in the organization. So I'm really excited to share this with our listeners today. So first of all, Ben, thank you so much for joining us today on our podcast, especially from across the pond. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Lauren. Um, it's great to be a part of it. Like I said, we've we've thoroughly enjoyed working with you guys for the last four years. So really pleased to, to be on today. I think there's a chance your accent just got like one tick heavier after going back home. Is that possible? It has to. And I, and I have to say football because I said soccer the other day to a few of my mates and I got absolutely ruined by them. So saying that I sound American now. So it's uh, it does get a bit thicker when I come home. Yeah, I don't want to be disowned over the holidays. Exactly. I think my parents already have. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so, Ben, can you share with us a little bit about your background in soccer? Yeah, so obviously in England, uh, soccer is the main sport by a mile, basically. So you have soccer as the main sport, and then every other sport kind of falls way below that. So rugby, cricket, golf, whatever. But as a young boy in England back then, um, it was just the norm to to get involved in soccer from a young age. So I, I think I started playing around four or five years of age. My dad had played at a, a really good level. My granddad had played. My dad was also a, a coach at a good level as well. So it was kind of that natural progression that I was always around the game as a, as a young kid and, and started playing it as a, at a young age as well. So it was just something that I got into at a young age and it just become a, you know, a major part of my life, even at such a young age. But I think, in, and you could probably speak to this a little bit, just culturally how much, we'll call it soccer for the all intents and purposes of this podcast, how much soccer is a part of just culture where you're from whereas kind of in the states we have a much more diverse exposure to sports it's just a different it's literally a different world there in terms of soccer's role in your daily life and culture there wouldn't you say yeah it's 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 a great point I mean soccer in England is it's not just a game it is part of England's culture Mm -hmm. Uh, so much within society reflects soccer in England as well Mm -hmm. um it's a massive part of of people's lives. I mean, people will literally, they'll work Monday to Friday to be able to either go play soccer on a weekend or go watch the team that they support. Um, And in England, it's very like people, especially in Wisconsin, right? People follow the Packers and, and and think how it's so, such, so tribal and whatever else. But in England, when you follow a team, it's at a much higher level and a higher scale. I mean, it really is tribal how you follow your teams and, it's like you said, it's a big part of your life and a big part of your culture. Um, and there's a strong pull to usually your local team too, right? Even if you have like an EPL team, that's your favorite, there's still a lot of like local ties within the culture of the sport, right? Yeah. Cause in, in England, you have basically 92 professional clubs, full-time professional clubs. So you obviously have the premier league, but then you have the championship league one league two, they're all professional clubs. So for instance, the team that is closest to me is Exeter City. Um, so I was kind of there as a kid, and that's the team I support. My dad's a season ticket holder still. Um, I'm taking Leo on Boxing Day this year, my son who's eight, to watch them play. He's going to be a mascot. So it's almost like a family tradition as well in terms of the team that you follow. Generally speaking, your family will follow that team as well. And um, and I, I don't even I don't support anybody in the Premier League. I, you know, I watch all the Premier League games. But the team that I support is Exeter. That is my, my important team. Yeah, it's uh, like in your blood. Correct. Yeah, exactly. It's a family thing. Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. So you actually brought this up. And just since we're talking over the holidays and stuff, and since people in the States may not fully understand or appreciate, talk to us about what Boxing Day is. In short, it's it's just another another day to have another another Christmas dinner. And it's another day where... <laughs> 
<laughs> Boxing Day used to back in the day, it was for all the men then to have you do Christmas with your family, and then Boxing Day is everyone goes off to football or, or soccer, whether you're playing or whether you're going to watch the team that you support. So in England, box everybody loves Boxing Day, probably more so than Christmas a lot of the time, because they you do Christmas with your family and then you get to go and meet up with all your friends at the soccer game, you know, whether you're playing or, or whether, like I said, watching the team that you follow. So my, me, my dad and my son now will be going to watch Exeter play Wickham on Boxing Day. Uh, and, and Leo's part of Leo's Christmas present is he'll be a mascot for the day. So he'll get to go walk on the pitch with the players in front of like 8,000 people and whatever else. So it's it's a big family kind of football day, Boxing Day in England. Yeah, that's awesome. I actually, um, I had a friend who was the physio for Southampton and had the yeah. opportunity to be there on Boxing Day. Um, and it's just take the electricity of a Packers game and then multiply it out by a hundred. And yeah. I feel like that's the electricity that I experienced on Boxing Day. Yeah, it's always bo- cool. Boxing Day and New Year's Day. They're kind of the two the two games of the year where the atmosphere will be unbelievable because mostly the stadiums, whether the team's doing well or not, will pretty much be sold out. Um, And the atmospheres will be, yeah, because it's packed, the atmospheres will be electric, like you said. That's awesome. Well, pretty cool insight to uh, things that we don't always get to see here. So obviously growing up playing soccer and things like that. So what brought you to the States then? Yeah, so I I think I graduated high school in 1999. Seems a long time ago now. Um, (laughs) A really long time ago, but so I ended up getting. I was playing uh, soccer at a good level, um, but I was I was also playing golf at a good level as well. I managed to get down to a two handicap, um, and all my all my friends were kind of going off to university. Um, but in in England, especially back then, university sports they're not very, they're not big. Um, it, it's almost like you know, Division One schools over here, like the club sports. So really, in England. At 18, if you're good enough at soccer, you turn professional. And if you're not good enough, you end up going to university just to go to university to go to school. You don't play sports at university, um, really, uh, back then especially. So I still wanted to play soccer and, and even golf at a good level. And I wanted to do something different to what my friends were doing. Um, and I knew of somebody that had gone over to America on a golf scholarship, just um, happened to know him. And at that time, back in 99, it wasn't big for English people or European people to go out to America and go to university on on scholarships. Um, Nowadays, it's almost the norm. Like in England, there's so many people now, professional clubs, they get released at age 18 and it's just the norm. Okay, I didn't get a pro in England. I'm going to go to America and try and get a scholarship, Um, which we'll touch on later is kind of a little bit detrimental to the US player. But Back then in 99, I, you know, like I said, I was playing, I was playing soccer at a good level. I was playing golf at a good level. So I managed to use both my soccer and my golf uh, to get a scholarship. So I had a basically a 50% soccer scholarship and a 50% golf scholarship to come out to the States to play. Um, I'd never been to America in my life. Um, so I knew nothing about America. It was basically a school in South Carolina that Limestone University that basically offered me a, a really good scholarship. I knew it would be warm there uh, and it was something different. <laughs> so that was as as basic as it sounds and as trivial as it sounds, that was kind of my thought process. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll give this a go. Uh, and that's kind of, in a nutshell, how it, how it all came about. That's amazing. Yep, it is, I've worked with many international athletes and it's a very kind of quick and unique process of sometimes how they've ended up over here. Um, and, it's, and it's different for everyone. And like you said, it's evolved a lot since you came over and what that experience is like with kids coming over and things like that. So what was it like as you transitioned from playing in England to playing in the States? How did that feel? Yeah, back then it was very, diff- it was very different. Um, I mean, first off, when I landed in South Carolina, I think they couldn't understand a word I said and, and I couldn't understand a word they said either. So it was, <laughs> it was a lot lost in translation. Um, but the, the game was very different. It was coming from England. And I, in England, when you get to a certain level, if you're a decent player, you actually start playing men's football. So at 16, 17, I was playing on a men's team. I was actually playing for the team my dad managed and coached for a bit as well. So I came from playing men's soccer against, you know, 25, 30-year-olds. Then I come to college and the game wasn't as physical. So I, 
Yeah. I think the first season, I probably still hold the record for yellow cards, I think. I was just going to uh, ask that. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't the referee's best friend. So it was, <laughs> I had to adapt because it just was, it wasn't as physical. It was, you know, I had to adapt my game to, to some respect when I first got there. <laughs> had to be a little bit more polite. <laughs> yeah, a little, that transition, yeah. And, I, uh, and you, Or just you, more you, sneaky. Yeah, you know me pretty well, Lauren. I'm uh, pretty competitive. <laughs> so it was, it was, uh, it took a while to uh, adapt to, um to things there but it was it was good I mean I got there you know played right away I ended up being captain my sophomore year all the way through senior year and you know started started every game and but and played golf for I think one of those years uh until we got the, the soccer program became very good so that all of my focus then was was just playing soccer really did you feel any like different um difference like tactically in the game in, in comparison being in the States or things like that outside of just kind of the temperature of the game? Um, the, well, when I first got there, the coach was from, was from Scotland. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So the coach was from Scotland. So it was the tactical aspect was similar to yeah. how, how I've been playing back home purely because the coach was from, from mm-hmm. this area. Um, but it, the, the pace of the game was different. Obviously in South Carolina, it was so hot. Um, yeah. I mean, there'll be times in preseason we weren't allowed to train because it was too hot. Right. Um, or we'd have to just do one session in the morning and that would be it. So the the pace of the game was a lot slower. Um, you had to value the ball a lot more because if you lost it, you didn't want to be chasing it because of the heat. Yeah. Um, so it was more so just the conditions. I mean, I would always I would always fly back two weeks early before preseason started and I would run on my own for two weeks to get adapted to the heat. Um, otherwise, I would be struggling. If I came back at the same time as everybody else, that first week of preseason would have been difficult. So I, I always made the choice to come back two weeks early um, to be ready for preseason. And then my junior and senior year, I, I played in back what, what was, um, it's now called USL2, but PDL, like mm-hmm. the summer league for college players. I stayed yeah. uh, and played in that as well to, to help myself be ready. Yeah. When I don't know, and I don't know if this kind of holds true um, in England or not in terms of the variety of teams and styles of play there, but like, when I was in college soccer working there, you could tell there were just different, um, not, not even styles of play, but styles of players that they would select that would affect the styles of play. So, and it's influenced by the university. So like I noticed like big 10 teams, so like big football schools, big basketball schools, but mostly the big football schools, you look at their soccer teams and they look for the big guys that are just going to body you off the ball. It was never a fast game. It was just going to be physical. And then there were some other kind of off conferences where that might be the quicker, sharper, shorter, more tactical teams. But I really saw, at least in the States, like the cultural influences from the university and the style of athletics, kind of almost shaping the style of athletes that they were selecting and then building into their program. Because we always knew, like, if you're going to Wisconsin, or at least during that time, like, you're, they have these big guys. They're just going to body you off the ball. That's their game. But we knew that they weren't fast, like all this stuff. So I don't know if that kind of exists there, but I think the selection of athlete and temperature of the school and style of the school definitely dictated what we were going to expect out of some of these teams that we were coming across. And it's very diverse. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, like like you touched on there, I think you, the, the Big Ten, that is, you know, how big, strong, powerful you are, right? And, and obviously... um where I played limestone university was a division two school. Mm. And back then there was, there was a lot of really, and especially now like division two or a few years ago, sorry, it was, there was a lot of really good players from Europe that came over that couldn't yeah. play division one. The NCAA, per NCAA rules at that time, if you've been paid a little bit of money to play in England or Europe, you couldn't yep. play division one. So you had mm. a lot of really good European players starting to play division two. So the soccer was really good. And was yeah. probably a bit more technical in terms of keeping the yeah. ball and, and playing and passing the ball, but they probably weren't as good as athletes as the Division One players. That was the biggest difference was the athleticism um, down and like you touched on down south with the weather, it's more of a technical game as well. The conditions are more conducive to playing good soccer. Right, you know, in the Midwest, it's kind of more considered blue collar, hard work. You've got to grind yeah. out results. So it's. Sometimes the style of play and the, the conference is dependent upon the climate that you're in as well. Yeah, absolutely. No, there's, I mean, it just brings on different barriers to play through and things like that. And definitely shapes how you have to tactically change your game to fit where you're at and what you've got. There's no doubt. 
so kind of talking about some of these differences and things like that. So once you finished your playing career, you then moved on to coaching at your university, correct? Yeah, I, I was to be honest, I was lucky because I had no clue what I was going to do. To be totally <laughs> honest, I was I was doing a double major in England, uh, sorry, in, in English and sports psychology. Um, and I was in my senior year and just came back for the spring semester. Um, and the head coach at the time just said to me, listen, what are you, you going to do when you graduate? And I said, I'm not, I'm not really sure. He said, well, you, you should go into coaching. Um, if I could get a full-time position, would you take it? And I said, yeah, definitely. So I literally went from being a player straight into a full-time assistant role um, and just was very fortunate and, and very lucky to be given that opportunity because I, I had Yes, I've been around the game for a long time, but I hadn't been a coach by, by any extent. Um, but I, I think I always, I think I always thought I'd be a good coach and get into coaching at some point. Because even even from a young age, you know, I would be writing lineups down, or I would be if you know if I'm the manager of Liverpool, who would I be signing, and this, that, the other. So it always been, I'd always been kind of fairly analytical in terms of that aspect, and I always thought I would would want to get into coaching, but I didn't know the pathway how to do it or what the route would be and it kind of the route and pathway just kind of fell into my lap so to speak um so yeah I was just very very fortunate to get the opportunity um sometimes it's the right place right time I say that all the time right it's sometimes it's about who you know to get the opportunity and it's about what you know to to keep it or to do well um and we did well I was lucky that in you know in five years we went to the NCAAs four years went to the sweet 16 and first time in the school's history and things like that. So it was a, a successful time for the program as well, which, which I was a small part of. So it was a, a privilege to be involved in it. Absolutely. So then from there, you made a big jump to division one, correct. And was the assistant at UWM. What were, um, tell us a little bit about that. And then what were some of the biggest differences that you saw kind of between those two environments? Yeah. So it was interesting. So the, the conference that I coached in was at that time was called the Conference Carolinas, and it was always Limestone University or Lees McRae University. At that time, we were the top two schools, always competing against each other. Um, and the head coach of Lees, Lees McRae um, ended up getting the Milwaukee job, the head coaching position. And he, I didn't really know him that well at that point, but we could have just coached against each other. We probably didn't like each other, actually, because we <laughs> were always competing against each other. But he got the job and he reached out and said, listen, I've got the job at Milwaukee. I've always, we've always had good battles against each other. I can see what a good job you do. Would you be interested? Um, and, at, and at that point in my life, it was, I was so driven at that point. It was all about, okay, I, I want to coach at the highest level I can. You know, I, I want to get to division one. I, I want to try and go as high as I can with my coaching. So, and I've been offered a few positions before that, um, but it was at the, that was the right time. I thought, yeah, this is a, a good opportunity and, and something I wanted to take advantage of. So, that's kind of how the opportunity came about. Um, to be totally honest, when 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 I got to Milwaukee, <laughs> I, I walked the first week of training. I was like, "Geez, the, the team that I've left behind at, at Limestone is way better than the team I've just inherited." Yeah. So it was, it was that was a shock because I wasn't expecting it. Um, it was kind of a rebuilding timeline of was, that team. Yeah, at that time it was a real rebuild, um, and we actually ended up bringing, I think a player from Limestone transferred in and a, and a player from Lees McRae transferred in as well, Jamie Bladen, who who used to coach with us at FC as well. So we managed to bring in a couple of players, but it was the biggest difference. And I, and I kind of say this to everybody, it's it's the speed of the game. At the Division One level, compl- compared to Division Two, the game is quicker. It's more powerful. They're better athletes. Um, they're stronger. I wouldn't necessarily say they're always technically miles better, but it's just that speed of play and the athleticism piece, which is very, very different, especially at the real highest level. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you the likes of UNC and Maryland and the Dukes of this world, that's when you're dealing with excellent soccer players, but excellent athletes as well. And I think that's the real difference at that level. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And then after that, you had spent, after a few years at UWM, you spent time as the associate head at Cardinal Stretch. So you really experience coaching on a very broad spectrum um, across collegiate soccer. So for kind of the youth and parents that are listening to this, what would you share to them that are some of the differences kind of between those environments? What are some of the benefits, you know, as kids and parents aren't navigating their decision-making of where should my kid go? What should they do? What are some of those things that you can highlight to them that help them understand what those environments are like? Yeah, I think, 
I've, I've been fortunate, like like you said, I, I managed to play Division Two, then coach Division Two, then coach Division One, and then obviously coached in the NAIA and and programs that have all done pretty well as well. So the the first thing that I try and say to players and parents is, listen, if if you get an opportunity to play in college at whatever level, it should be celebrated mm-hmm. because it means you've done well. You you you've obviously played for a certain amount of years. You've been disciplined. You've you developed. So whether it's Division One, Two, Three, or NAIA or junior college. If you're getting an opportunity to play in college, celebrate it as parents. Don't be stressed out by the process. Actually, just be pleased that your, your son or daughter is getting that opportunity. Yeah. Um, and there are there are good programs at every level. There are also bad programs at every level as well. So it's too much. I always say to players and families, don't get caught up on whether it's Division One, Division yeah. Two, Division Three. Find the right fit where you think your son or daughter is going to enjoy playing, mm-hmm. most importantly, get a, a good education and a good life experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we always try and use the term with our players of, listen, when when you pick a school, we want you to think about this. If you went there, and heaven forbid, the first day of preseason, you got injured and you can never play the sport again, would you still want to be at that school? Yeah. And if the answer is no, you're probably picking the wrong school. Yeah. Okay? So we always say pick the school – based off of the school, the academics, the location, the experience that you're going to get, and then match up a soccer program in relation to that as well. And and like I said, I think no matter what level you play at, the experience of being a student athlete is an unbelievable experience. And in terms of developing you as a person and a leader and a character, it's so important. Um, and it's one of my I get on my high horse here, but it's one of my bug bearers. Of, I think you have too many clubs and too many coaches that just try and push kids to go play division one. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, no, listen, there's good programs at every level. Go and play, go somewhere where first you're going to enjoy it and get a really good experience, whatever level, level that may be. Yeah. Uh, but don't just give up. We've had kids in the past who could have gone and played division two and been really, really good, but they kind of had their ego hurt a little bit that they didn't get a division one offer. So they just stopped playing. And yeah. I'm always like, listen, it's a great experience being a student athlete at whatever level you play at. And if you go to Division Three school and after a year you don't like it, well, then fine. At least you know. Mm-hmm. In my opinion, if you get that opportunity, you have to take it because it could be four of the best years of your life. And you'll make probably some of the best friends of your life as well during that period. Absolutely. I mean, you learn leadership, teamwork. It's more challenging being away from home and going through it having your own time management where a parent isn't driving all these things for you. I mean, you build so many, um, you know, qualities about yourself during that time. And, and, you know, the, the sport also provides challenge for you and forces you to grow in ways that you probably won't even know, you know, that during those four to five years that you're playing, you know, you definitely come out a totally different person, you know, hundred percent. I mean, I think you go through adversity, you see what you're made of. You have to work within a team. I mean, it's, for me, it's the life lessons that you learn. Um, I just think I just think it's it, it's so important um, yeah. to be able to do that. And rightly or wrongly, I mean, I know you've obviously been in college athletics. If you're a student athlete, you get far more support than just a regular yes. student. Correct. You know? I know there's some parents at times they kind of worry. Well, I'm worried about my son going to college and playing a sport. Can he do it all? And I'm like, listen, he'll get far more help. If he's a student athlete, you'll get tutors, you'll get help picking your classes. Yep. The help is available there for you if you're a student athlete. So utilize it. Yep. And even like going above and beyond that, you know, as you start entering the working force, A, people really like hiring athletes usually because they know those things about them, but also the alumni connections and ties and things like that, that also come from having been a part of those programs you know, you can't even measure the impact that it has on some of these kids for the long term of what happens even after sport is finished. Um, I've definitely seen that play out at Marquette and things like that. And, you know, it's just, um, you know, being an athlete has value well beyond just those immediate years. Um, but yeah, I really like what you said about not placing value on the number one, two, NAI, whatever, you know, one, two, three, NAIA, but finding the quality of the program you know, and not holding it to just what level is it at? I think that's a really good piece of advice. Yeah. Like I said, that there is, there is really good players at every level. Like I said, the team that I left at, at Limestone was way better than the team I got to at Milwaukee. Right. Yeah. And there are, there are some division one programs that aren't necessarily great environments. So it's, 
like I saw a quote the other day from a from a coach on social media, which I disagreed with. It was something like, um, you know, we only set we we only try and send kids to Division One schools, not to just any school. And I'm and I'm reading it like, first off, what what is just any school? Right. Like, you know, just any school for me or you might be a great school for somebody else and a great experience. Mm-hmm. So it's for, like for us as a club, it's it's not about just trying to send kids to Division One. It's trying to send kids to all different colleges at different mm-hmm. parts of the country at different levels to get those experiences. I think that's the most important thing is, you know, can you get your players and your families to be open-minded and try different things and look at different schools? Because again, like you said, in terms of learning and those life lessons, that's what you're going to get. Totally. So following your time in collegiate coaching, you transitioned to youth club coaching, and now you're currently the co-director at FC Wisconsin. What drove you to shift into the youth soccer arena? Um, I think I was I was offered a good opportunity with because at the time I was coaching at um, what is now Elmbrook it used to be Elmgrove, mm-hmm. uh, so I was also, during my time at Milwaukee I was coaching club as well um, in the spring and then I got offered an opportunity at, at FC Milwaukee as it was back in the time back in the day um, and I felt it was an opportunity where I could make a difference to try and change the um, the trajectory that the club was on it was in a bit of a bad way. Um, and myself and, and Billy Solberg, who's the other co-director, we kind of got brought together by a mutual friend of ours. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just seemed a good opportunity whereby we thought we could come in and, and change things around and really try and grow the club and kind of change the culture and the environment which is set in. So I, I'm a real competitive person and it, it was a real challenge. Um, and within a couple of weeks, it was a we realized it was a bigger challenge than we even realized it was. Um <laughs> but it was it was that opportunity and that challenge to try and do something special and try and change something which maybe wasn't going down the right path. Um, yeah. And I always think, to be honest, college coaching, a massive part of college coaching is recruiting, um, whereas club coaching, the massive part is coaching. And you mm-hmm. actually get to work more in terms of coaching the players on the grass. Yeah. and you get to, Building the players. Yeah, you, you get to develop players more. You probably miss a little bit of the the day-to-day interaction that you have with college kids where you see them every day. But in terms of the actual effect that you can have on players and and kids, I think it's far greater in the youth game and you can have, you know, far lasting um, effects, you know, coaching in the youth game. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So, um, I mean, you've kind of stood back and seen the youth game for a long time now. Um, what are some of the things that you would like to see happen in the youth landscape for soccer to improve its trajectory over the coming years? Do you think? Um, I think, well, I think firstly, I think there's been so many improvements, right? I think the coaching is better. I think facilities are getting better. I think there are way more leagues for good and bad. Um, so I think there's a lot that's improved Yeah, for me the biggest area of improvement that still needs to happen is the ages of U6 to U12. Um, That is where the fundamentals of any soccer player are kind of ingrained into them. It's that age Mm -hmm. from six to 12. Yeah. Um, And it's, and I think clubs and ourselves included, we have to invest more in those younger age groups in terms of the coaches, in terms of the support that we give them um, in, 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 in turn of the resources that we give them. Those are the age groups where we need to invest more uh, and coaches need to be reward, rewarded more for coaching those age groups because it's tough, right? I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do it. I probably don't have the patience for it. Okay. <laughs> see my, see my eight year old son. Now I get frustrated just watching as a parent. Um, so <laughs> it, it, take, it takes so much skill and yeah. patience and empathy to coach at those age groups. Mm-hmm. So in reality, you should have your, your best coaches working in those age groups, but unfortunately we kind of have it backwards. We have our best coaches working with our older age groups. Yeah. Um, so I, that's where I think we need to invest more. I think there needs to be smaller pitches, less numbers. For me, at U13, they should not be playing on a full-size pitch. It's just way too big for them. Um, yeah. I, I always use, like Sweden as, a, as, a, as an example now, they're not playing 11 v 11 until they get to high school. Um, oh, wow. not saying you have to go that far, but I, I just think, the pitches right now are still too big for the players that are on them. And so yeah. you're getting the bigger, stronger, faster kid at U10 is getting rewarded. Whereas the real technical player who's maybe got a really good soccer IQ, but he's just really small. He he's can get- drowned in the field. 
yeah, he can get discouraged. And then you lose these kids that could end up being really good players. Um, so it's for me, it's that it's that age range, six to twelve. That's got to be a big focus, in my opinion, of can we do more in those age groups? Um, and I also think as good as the progress we've had, um, I, I think there's almost at times too much structure. I think there's almost too much coaching at times now. Um I was saying to someone the other day, I think too often we tell kids to pass the ball. And at these younger ages, especially six to like six to 12, like I've touched on, let kids dribble. Even if they're dribbling at the wrong time and they're giving the ball away, stop telling kids to pass the ball and play one and two touch all the time. You know, they, you know, at these ages, we don't need to necessarily be focused on, on tactical development at these real young ages, get them loving the ball, get them loving dribbling the ball. If they're making bad decision, who cares? They're seven years of age. But allow them to just play free and dribble and, and do things and, you know, have silly celebrations and whatever else. I think we we start to put too much structure in at too yeah. young of an age. Um, and I always use the example, South America is still producing the best attacking players. And it's not because they've got the best organization. They're actually a mess. You know, Brazil, Argentina, their federations are a mess half the time. It's because the kids are playing in the streets and it's all street soccer and there's no structure. Yeah. It's, it's when the coaches come in that we kind of, too often, we coach the the creativeness and the expression out of them. And we have to be yeah. careful of that as well. Yeah, that's a very interesting insight. Um, I mean, you just look at a lot of the successful countries in this sport. I mean, it starts young and it's like you're saying, we give them the technical skills, but allowing them to express it, play it, not shut them down. I mean, that's... I, I like how refreshing of a thought process that is to just let them experience the sport and love the sport, because if they do all those things, it'll be easy to harness them later in life. You know, if the, after they've built that skill set and that comfort zone with the ball and what's going on around them and stuff like that. That's, I like what you're saying about maybe we need to also rethink how we are coaching those kids and who's coaching those kids to have that long-term effect on their development and love for the game and maybe there's other ways to look at it through a different lens than kind of how we traditionally try to micromanage things especially um that's definitely a u.s trade as well as we're like micromanaging making sure we have the best child on the field at all times yeah, kind of thing yeah. well, and it was, a, it was a good quote um i saw the other day it was something like um like coaches need to enter their world and not expect the kids to enter our world yeah so at a, a U7's world is very different to mine. A U7's world is just play, run around, do silly things. My world, it's no, you need to be structured. You need to keep the ball. This that, That's not what they want. Mm. They're, U, they're U7, right? It's, yeah. As coaches, we've got to go into their world and give them what they want in terms yep. of you know fostering and instigating that love of the game. That's the totally. most thing at those younger ages. And too often coaches and, and parents, we, we get in the way of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the temperature in a lot of sports that, that's always on commentary in the news in the States of stuff like that, of kind of parents getting in the way of kids, just having the opportunity to play and enjoy what they're doing. So, you know, not that it's like a punishment to the parents, but it's like, just let them do what they need to do and let them enjoy it and have fun. Let, and, let them fail. Let them fail. Cause they don't, yeah. I, failure is a good thing to experience. Yeah. As much, listen, and I, I see it now as a parent, right? I've got my, my son who's eight who plays and I catch myself doing everything wrong in terms of what we tell parents to do. Right. Yeah. You know? Like I'm getting in the car after a game and I, and Leo's getting in the car and I'll be frustrated because maybe he hasn't worked hard or he hasn't played well. And yeah. I sit in the car and I have to check myself and say, listen, just say, I really enjoyed watching you play. Even though I don't, <laughs> even though I don't mean it at that moment in time, you know, but I, so I now have a greater appreciation for when parents do sometimes do the wrong things on the sideline or yeah. say the wrong things, you know, because I, I do it and I have to catch myself. Yeah. But it's, yeah. as much as we maybe don't want to hear it, the kids at these ages, they don't really care if they win or lose. Yeah. They just, they just want to enjoy it and have fun. And mm -hmm. they want to catch their parents watching them and, and, and enjoying them play as yeah, well. And being proud of them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so I have to say a lot of things to my eight-year-old that I don't necessarily mean, but I know it, but I know it's important for him at that, at that moment in time. <laughs> I, I can imagine the things that are running through your head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Team. Yeah. Yeah. After having been on the sideline with you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um so you've been at a various collection of youth clubs and obviously seen a lot of them coach and coach, uh, you know, against them. Um, 
so you've had a lot of exposure in this arena now. So tell us about FC Wisconsin and your programming or your approach to player development. Like what makes FC Wisconsin different? Good question. I think you get asked that a lot. And I think, and I think every club, right. will say, you know, we're, yeah. every club will try and say we're different or every club will say, yeah. Coaching methodology and, uh, and a curriculum or whatever else and a, and a philosophy. But then I think when you actually sit them down and say, okay, so what is your philosophy? What does make you different? Then it kind of goes a bit quiet. And it will just kind of, you'll probably get the standard line of, well, we, we want to develop players to be the best that they can be, right? Standard line. For, for us, in order to do that, we we really believe in the collaborative coaching model, whereby it's not one coach to one team. Okay. Yeah. So we want we want multiple coaches working with age groups. We want age groups training together. Um, ultimately, coaching is is teaching, right? So the more coaches you can get around players, the more in, the more individual attention they're getting, hence the more learning that's taking place. So I think that's very different. I think, especially in this area, it is still very much one coach to one team. So you, if you go out to watch a club train, you'll see the U13s on one field with one coach doing something. Then you'll see on another field, the U14s with another coach doing something. And it's completely different. And, and in my opinion, then you're not really a club. You're just a collection of teams under a club umbrella. You know, if you really want to be a, a club and have a curriculum and a philosophy, there needs to be a, a trend running through the club, a methodology running through the club. And the way that we feel you do that, and again, other clubs may be different, but for us, it's about having multiple coaches working with age groups, having teams train together, um, having teams across, have, having coaches, sorry, across different programs that know the players. Um, we're big on, it's not where you start with us, it's where you end up. So if a, if a kid joins us and he starts on a on a second team, but after six months, he's just developed at such a rate that he should be moved across to the first team, we move him to the first team because it's right for that player. Um, yeah. I think because parents pay and they pay a lot of money for, for youth sports, I think there is too much that goes on to appease parents and not enough that is done in the best interest of the players and the kids. And what we say is, for us as a club, it is individual player development first, the club second, and the team third. So say we've got a second team, like I just touched on, and there's a kid that's doing really, really well. If it's right for that individual player to be moved across to the first team, we will do it. Even though it might weaken the team that he's on, in our list, it's player development first, club second, team third. So we'll move that player to the first team because it's right for that individual. Mm -hmm. Um and, and vice versa, if there's a kid that is maybe struggling on the first team, maybe he's just a bit undersized and is going through a bit of a confidence crisis, there'll be times when we'll move him across to go play with the second team to get a bit more confidence and to play a few more minutes while still bringing him back across with the first team. So we try to be fluid in terms of moving players across rosters when we think it's right for player development. Um, it's not like 10 players every week, but there's there will always be one or two that you should be should be looking to move. And I, I feel, and we feel, sorry, as a club, if you're really about player development, there should be some players that are moving across rosters, especially at the younger ages, because development is so up and down. Yeah. And kids develop at such different rates. And I think, <clears throat> don't get me wrong, it can be difficult because you've got to have honest conversations with parents and they have to buy into it and they have to trust the process and believe what you're doing is right. Uh, and it can be difficult at times. But I think if you're really about player development, there should be players that move across rosters at different points in their progression and their journey as well. Yeah. Well, and that shows that you as coaches really know your players too, because there are certain kids that will thrive with the challenge of the bar being raised. And at certain times, there's kids that don't do well in that situation. There's kids that do. And like you're saying too, maybe they need to go down for the confidence builder, you know, it, things like that. And that just shows that you guys as a staff know your kids even beyond just their technical abilities, because you're trying to find places where they're going to thrive and grow. Yeah. I mean, I, I, to, you probably know uh, Zach Wegner, who played at Marquette, obviously mm -hmm. played for us at FC Wisconsin. He was always technically really good. But I, I think at U16, he was a little small. So he, he, we, he was on the first team. We moved him across to the second team for a year because he was just struggling a little bit. And then he just blossomed and he kicked on again. And then he got moved back across to the first team and then obviously went on to, to play at Marquette and be captain at Marquette. So we always kind of use him as an example, as a, a as a story where, listen, this is why we do this and it works. And 
it's and we as you notice we as trivial as this sounds we tell all of our coaches never say up or down it's always across because yeah. to a parent and a player yeah up and down can yeah. be positive or negative so we, we say okay we talk to a parent we say listen such and such is struggling right now we want to move them across to go and play with the ecnl rl team this weekend or it might be a, this kid's doing really well so we say listen we want to move you across to go play with the ecnl we, we try not to say up and down because i think then parents and players get stuck on that as well and they go yeah. into the wrong mindset so yeah. as, as trivial as it sounds that that communication is important as well absolutely i couldn't agree more i I honestly, that's never a conversation that you and I have ever had to have surrounding who I'm seeing or treating or things like that. And that to me is a very eye-opening statement of how semantics makes such a big difference, um, you know, in the player's outlook of what's going on and where they're at and keeps their mind in it and things like that. Because yeah, you're right. There's a lot that gets associated with up and down. And, um, you know, that's just a more proactive way of managing your players and your teams and your parents and helping them see the path that they are on versus it just being like a positive or negative thing. Um, so that's interesting. I've never had that conversation with you before. I like that. Yeah. But it's, and you've, it's, it takes, it takes a long time and there's, yeah. it takes a, it takes a heck of a lot of work to be honest behind the scenes and the coaches communicating and, you know, having daily chats about players, which, yeah. which, which parents never see or never hear. Um, but too many clubs won't do it because, Listen, some parents don't respond well to it. Yeah. Uh, we've had to have those difficult conversations too. But listen, I always think if if generally speaking, if you make the parents a part of the journey, then they'll buy into it as well and they'll be invested. Now, we always say to parents, you're an important part of your son or, or daughter's development and their journey, but you can't control the journey. Right. You've got to, you've got to allow them to fail and you you can't be it used to be the term was helicopter parent, right? And now it's I yeah. think the, the more modern term is the, which is um, pretty poignant for Wisconsin. It's the snowplow parent. Right? Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't, be, don't be the snowplow parent that tries to remove every obstacle from your, your son or yeah. daughter. You know, let them, you've got to let them fail because then they see what they're capable of. Yeah. They see what they can overcome. So it's always, the, the parents are really important to the player's development journey. They're mm. a part of it, but yeah. they can't try and control that journey. And yeah. that's, that's important. And we always try and say, trust the process. But I, I we've even started to have to go a bit further with that of, listen, trust the process doesn't mean that if you trust in it, your kid's going to go play division one and then be pro. Trusting right. the process means that your kid is ultimately going to end up playing at the right level for his or her's ability mm -hmm. where he's going to enjoy it and still love the game. Yep. Whether that's, whether that's playing on a first team or a third team, right? Which trust is a very important thing. Because exactly. I've watched a lot of I've watched a lot of athletes finish their careers and not want to touch a ball again. Exactly, um, and it's yeah for me because you know you can get some parents who say, "Well, we you said trust the process, and now he's on a second team." Yeah, tr that's the right level for your son, and he's enjoying it, and he's thriving, and he's happy. So yep. trusting the process is about ultimately believing that your son or daughter will play at the correct level for them, where they're going to continue to love the game and still have that game a part of their life, hopefully. Totally. So we've been fortunate to work with you guys for we as in kinetic have been able to work with FC for almost about four years now. And we've done various things from injury consultations to education to performance testing. You guys have kind of given us an open door there. Share with our listeners, like, why did you choose to allow us to be a part of your organization? Like, why have you given us time out of your sessions and things like that to do these things? Well, I think firstly, because of the, the knowledge and expertise that, you know, Kinetic and yourself have in the in this area of sports medicine and performance. Um, obviously, you're re we're a really respected company and, and what you do. But I think also for us as a club, I think one of our big mantras is we, we want to try and go above and beyond in terms of can we do more for our players and more for our families. And in terms of yourself and what and Michael, what you guys have brought in in, in terms of the education you, you do for our players and families, just coming out to the training sessions, um, the extra work that you do, which nobody else sees, your your company and what you do and the service you provide, you go above and beyond, which fits with what we try and do as an organization. Um, it's not the best. We, we've partnered with other people in the past where it was kind of almost the bare minimum. Uh, and for us, it, that's not what we're about. So it didn't really align. 
So I think that alignment between just how much work you guys do to help our athletes and our players behind the scenes, it really aligns with what we try and do behind the scenes from a soccer perspective as well. So I think the last four years have been outstanding in terms of what we've got out of it. We've, We've probably got a, a heck of a lot more out of it than you have, unfortunately. But, but we, but we, we appreciate that as well. Yeah. Well, I think it just speaks to the organization and its goals that you really have a limited time that you have them for every training session, you know, or X number of days a week, or especially when we're indoor, that time is literally at a premium, and you guys still find the value to set aside time for us to kind of take those players from that training scenario and go through education or testing or workshops or whatever it is, because it tells me that you guys are valuing these additional pieces for your players that you're willing to give of X amount of training time for us to speak to them, to teach them about these things or, you know, and cause there's, a, it would be easier as a coach to be like, you know, I only have them for an hour. I just can't do it. You know? Yeah. And no, I, I think, think you guys have shown that investment in your players by taking the time for these things. I think that's I think that's the best word there. The investment. I think you guys invest so much into our players, and our families, and the education, and the, obviously everything else that you bring to it. And that's what we try and do as well. Yeah. Um, and, and I always, I think we we always say to players, listen, the, your development, the biggest part of your development is not what you do with us; it's what you do away from us. Mm-hmm. So, we, you know, it's just training with us three three to four times a week isn't enough. It's if you really want to get to high level, it's what you're doing away from us and. The, right. the aspects that you can educate them with um, and all the, the things that you bring to the table, those are extra added things that they can be doing to help them along the journey, not just to be a good player, but just to be healthy, you know, and physically in good shape as a human being. Um, totally. I right couldn't agree more. Good. Yep. And healthy players are available players and teams with more available players win. So exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. simple well, math. <laughs> And especially nowadays, like, like you know, it's, it's so important, you know, the whole mental health aspect, you know, Back when I played, you know, sound like an old dinosaur, but it wasn't it wasn't focused on enough. You know, looking back, there's there's I can certain scenarios. I'm like, I can't believe that happened or that coach did that, which wouldn't be allowed yeah. now, luckily. But I think even just you know feeling good about yourself and and doing you know PT or rehab or just stretching and knowing what to do to make yourself feel good about yourself is important. Mm-hmm. And I think you, you guys have brought that to the table as well, which is like again is vitally important. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's been fun. We've really enjoyed being there and being able to take some of the things that we know that we use on a higher level and still being able to execute them <clears throat> in this club setting has really played out nicely. So it's a very um, nice, balanced, healthy partnership that we get to utilize our skill set outside the clinic, <clears throat> excuse me, with your kids. And it's been a lot of fun and you guys have great kids that work hard. So it works out well. So we touched on this a little bit because you had already kind of started to give some really good advice about doesn't really matter what division level you're in, as long as you're in a good place, things like that. But, you know, as you talk to parents and players outside of finding the right place for you, what's just a couple of the pieces of advice that you give to those high schoolers or parents that are starting to look into that college recruiting process or looking to play on that next level? The the biggest and the best advice we can ever give players and parents is it is the player that has to drive the recruiting process. And I think too many players and too many families, they watch too many movies and they think a college coach is just going to show up at one of their games, think they're really good and offer them a scholarship. And then you get to to May of your senior year and you wonder why you haven't signed anywhere. It is, kids have it backwards. It's not the college coaches that instigate the recruiting process. It is the players Mm -hmm. that have to instigate the process by recruiting the schools. So the players have to put a lot of work in in terms of they need to email schools initially to get the schools interested to then want to come to watch them play. So again, for what we do is we obviously we do a recruiting presentation once a year for the whole membership, but then we also do individual meetings with our juniors and seniors if if they want them with their parents to find out what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And we always say, listen, you need to have a list of at least initially 15 to 20 schools across all divisions. Um, and then you've got to send us that list and we'll tell you what, what we think is realistic and what's not. So yeah. we have to have those honest conversations as well in terms of giving them real feedback. And then they have to send emails to those schools in terms of, and we have like a, an email template that we, the players can use, but it, the work is done by them to initially, you have to start the process. You have to drive the recruiting process. And I always say to parents, listen, if, 
if you're the one at home that is making this list and you're the one at home that's doing this email for your for your kid, it's a problem. Yeah. And is, does he does he or she really want to play in college? If they really want, you can help them by all means. You're there to support, to guide, you know, to help them as much as you can. But they have to drive the process um, because when you get to college, and I say this to players all the time, it is not always going to be fun. It is hard because you're expected to be a full time student and a full time soccer player. Yeah. There will be times where you won't want to go to training. You'll be like, oh, I just don't want to train today. I'm tired or whatever. And you've got to be able to grind through it. And if you don't love the game and if you and at this point in this juncture, if you're not really driving the recruiting process, I worry, will you actually make it through all four years of playing? Yep. It's going to be mm-hmm. difficult. And as parents, that's what we tell them. You help them, you guide them, but they've got to drive that process. Yeah. They've got to utilize the coach's help on staff. Um, and we always say, once you've emailed coaches, let us know who you've emailed. Because then generally we'll know somebody at that school that we can drop a text to and say, hey, listen, you've got an email from such and such. He's a good player. Yeah. You can watch him play. And that and kind of goes, process. Yeah. Yeah. And that goes a long way. But they have to drive that process. They have to take the time to put together individual emails to these college coaches, make sure you get the names right um, and do it professionally. And then it's about, whether you go to an ID camp or whether you're at a showcase yeah. that you perform well and you conduct yourself in the best possible way mm-hmm. uh, and try and stand out from other players, have some personality. Don't just fit in with everybody else, but try and stand out in the right way. Yeah. Um, but it's, I, I, it's the biggest, the biggest thing we say is you've got to drive that process. It's so important that you initiate contact with college coaches first. I couldn't agree more. And I think that's a really good, piece of advice for more than just soccer (laughs) you know honestly it's it's a thing in life as our kids are growing and going on to the next step of their lives and things like that it's it's a good thing to have ownership over your destiny and put in the effort and learn the fruits of those labor or lack thereof and you know be in charge of it a little bit more yeah so that being said so we go to a fun little lightning round at the end here Few easy questions that Ben does not know that I have the list to. <laughs> oh, geez, this could be interesting. It's not incriminating or anything, I promise. <laughs> um, just a fun few things just to let people get to know you a little bit. So I guess you already partially said it, but if you had to pick an EPL team, even though you're not an EPL guy, if you had to pick an EPL team, what would it be? Liverpool. You say that like begrudgingly. <laughs> I, yeah, it's hard. I used to like Liverpool when I was a kid. So I would say Liverpool, but yeah, but like I said, it would be way down below Exeter, of course. Okay, since you're in England and since a lot of us have not been there who are listening to this, what's like your favorite like English food or something like that that you would not find in the States that like when you get home, this is what you're going to have? I I love a good English fry up, which is a breakfast. So like, and it's People in America say, well, we we have that in America. No, it's different. Like sausages, eggs, bacon, baked beans, hash browns, a proper English fry up, as we call it. There's not there's nothing better than that. <laughs> and my second know. choice, which you'll be surprised about, is in England, Indian food is big. So oh. I love good Indian as well. So my the two most important meals for me when I come home is an English fry up and an Indian curry. Interesting. Very interesting. I, you're right. I would not have guessed that. Yeah. Um, top place that you've ever played soccer. Um, top where have I played? I've played on Bournemouth and I've played on Southampton's stadiums. So big, big arenas. Yeah. Southampton was probably the best one. Absolutely. Been there. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, so last one, if you, and I steal this from Mike Robertson, he does this at the end of his podcast. If you could look back at the younger version of you, knowing what you know now, what's maybe one piece of advice you would have given yourself? We're going deep now. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah. Um, probably slow down and enjoy it more. Yeah. I think I was, I was, and I, still, I probably am still now, I was, I was so competitive and so driven. I don't know if I necessarily enjoyed the good moments enough. It was too quickly. All right, that's done. Now what am I doing? Now what am I going to be pushing for? And I, yeah. my, I think feel be be relaxed enough to enjoy the good moments. I think that's fair. That's fair. 
So on that, we're going to leave it with that one. Um, so thank you, Ben, for joining us today. Um, you can always learn more about FC Wisconsin on social media. Um, if you check out at FC Wisconsin Nationals or online at fcwisconsin.com. So thanks so much, Ben, again, and to our listeners for joining us today on the Milwaukee Sports Performance Podcast. I hope that you enjoyed getting to know a little bit more about FC and Ben as a coach and as a person like I did. I learned new things today for sure. And I've been staying next to you for four years. Um, And we will see you all on the next podcast. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks for having me. Thank you.